Please sit down. We're about to start. The governor is here. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we'd like to apologize for the delay. Most of our guests are back in Abuja trying to settle in to join us virtually, and that's because of the weather. We will start very soon. Please have your seats so the 12th Bola Tinubu Colloquium can begin. Oh, oh, babe, to serve our Father Lord, with love and strength and faith, the labor of our heroes past shall never be. And we remain that humbly to the national to serve with heart and mind, 
One nation bound in freedom, peace and unity. Welcome to the 12th edition of the Bola Ahmed Tinubu Colloquium. As their custom, we commence with prayer. Please welcome Imam Abdullahi Abubakar, known for peace building after shielding 262 Christians from sectarian attacks in just Plateau State. And to take the Christian prayer, Mr. Ikem. <laughs> اللهم <laughs> So let's bow our head as we pray. Father, we thank you for a gathering such as this. Thank you for life. Thank you for providence. Thank you for all that you have provided for us that we may yet see today. And Lord, we are asking and requesting that you take charge of these proceedings. Everything that we do, we commit to your hands. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. The Chairman of the Colloquium, His Excellency Muhammad Buhari, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency Ernest Bai Karoma, the former President of Sierra Leone, the Special Guest of Honor, His Excellency the Vice President of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Asubanjo, and the, our host, the Executive Governor of Kano State, His Excellency Abdullah Omar Ganduje, and all Executive Governors of the respective states present physically and virtually. Distinguished Senators of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Honorable Members of the House of Representatives, Members of the Federal Cabinet, and Ministers of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Honorable Members of the Kano State Legislator and the, the respective states Legislator present, members of the Kano State Cabinet and respective states cabinets here present, members of the diplomatic corps, our respective royal majesties and royal fathers present, members of the press, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again to the 12th Bola Tunubu Colloquium, holding in the beautiful ancient city of Kano and around the world. After a break in transmission induced by COVID-19, the world around has changed in, in past one year, and so we have. The event that used to be physical event has changed into a hybrid one, with thousands and thousands joining us over Zoom webinar on live television. Here at the Bola Tinubu Colloquium, we convene not only in honor of Ashwaju Bola Tinubu on his birthday, but also to exchange ideas and shape our minds, shape the nation of the people. Our theme this year, our common bond, our commonwealth, the imperative of national cohesion for the growth and prosperity. This year, faculty presents a rich blend of experience background, both locally and internationally. 
My name is Bofa Sali, and with me, Stephanie Onishi Adams. We have been your program guides for today. Our first order of the day will be to welcome a welcome note by our host, uh, His Excellency. So we're going to have that shortly. Thank you. It is 10 a.m. on a wet Monday morning, sometime in the year 2001. The cabinet meeting of the Lagos State Executive considered many issues. The debate is extensive and heated at times, but always focused and productive. All the contributors looked forward to the vibrant discourse that helped shape the fortunes of Lagos State and some other states. Years mm -hmm. later, Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu, having served two terms as governor, often found himself and all the usual suspects and contributors still involved in these intense debates about a progressive Nigeria. So, one day, some of the contributors thought, why not go public with our conversations to mark Ashiwaju's birthday? This could broaden the solution base to our common national issues. Consequently, the Bola Tinubu Colloquium was born. With a wife like this, is politics not sexy? Patriots alive or departed that can match the commitment, resilience, creativity that Aswaju Bola Tinubu has over the few decades demonstrated in organizing Nigeria's public life for good. Presidency for pioneering this program. So every once in a while, I think that history gives us one or two persons who are gifted transformative leaders. And I believe that our country has been gifted by this great transformative leader, Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Inubu. We seek to constitute a nation where all the basic sustenance and sufficient food on their tables a sturdy and sheltering roof over their heads, 
and the fair chance and means to sustain and further enrich their life as they see fit. Let it be that all that we may live in social contentment and peace with our neighbors as with ourselves. This is what we mean by next level. May God give it to us. Thank you for giving me this birthday wish. God bless you. Maybe we have not memorized our past present enough, how we were carved, joined, and born. A hundred years and more of who we have been and where we have walked. Sixty years and counting of liberty and ceremonies of silence and uttered words. We can now tell the stories as history or not. A tale of strife, coups, and then a civil war. Mostly, we might not like the places that they take us, but the great and all the anonymous dead are there. And here, they cannot watch history repeat itself. Hear the sounds of all the sounds we brought on ourselves. The stillborn and the young, tongue versus tongue, and creed versus creed. Helmets, boots, guns, hunger, conscription, and deprivation. The sour taste of it all still lingers on our tongues, but is fading from our memory. But where are we going to be? And why? And who? Those long gone, young and unborn, want to know, do we mean to be the people we meant to be? To keep on going where we meant to go? Gentle, but forceful and graphic reminders of the sordid details of conflict. The evidence from our neighbors teaches a lesson we partook in as peacekeepers. In the 90s, we sent men to Liberia, to Sierra Leone, and have witnessed the gory sight of it all for these nations, their citizens, and children. To rebuild a monumental effort, stone and slab, brick and mortar, and the human psyche. Rwanda leave out a nightmare in short bursts. Libya and Syria still linger in war after a decade. But how do we fashion the future today? How do we address the commonplaceness of conflict and estrangement intrinsic in human exchange? I have rights. You have rights. We all have rights, not just situational, but constitutional and God-given. The right to life, to move, fair hearing, personal liberty, dignity, and my dreams and thoughts. Who would have thought that no one would be responsible? No one responsible enough to be responsible for our safety, security, prosperity, welfare, and our dreams. Hear a chant from the young, perhaps we are responsible only to the extent that there is reason and thought. So we ask, can human faculties overcome estrangement? Can conflict be overcome by reason? Are there relatives or absolutes, uniformity or organic unity in diversity? Do we approve of a revolutionary attitude? or at a minimum, employ a revolutionary rhetoric. Extremism infused with intolerance and self-righteousness might lead to a greater evil than those it attacks. How can divisions and conflicts among men and women be moderated? Existing social and political institutions may be imperfect, but insofar as they assure some kind of order, they have great value. Democracy should not be found in parties, but between parties. We, who were many people together, cannot become the people falling apart. We, who dream for every child and even chance, cannot let luck alone send children to school. We, whose law was never so much of the hand as the head, cannot let chaos make its way to the heart. We who have seen learning struggle from teacher to child cannot let ignorance spread itself like rot. We who have seen rumors in Gulf villages cannot stand idly by as disinformation propaganda crawl the web to inflame our nation. We know what needs doing and saying. We know we need growth and jobs, but grow we shall, even if in degree by slow degree, believing ourselves toward all we have tried to become just and compassionate, equal, able, and free. So it is held not in accepting our lot as a nation, but in reforming it. All groups must come together to reason together a cohesion of the human faculty of reason to develop a thoughtful community and not in one that remains what it has always been, but one that comes together in a reforming community, a community that is imperfect, but can gradually perfect itself. 
This is our common bond. This is our common wealth. Please, everybody remain seated. Our guests are here. Announcing the arrival of the celebrant. You're welcome, sir. Can everybody remain seated, please? Please, everybody, keep seated, please. Please, cameraman, you could sit down. You can take pictures later on. The president is already seated. Please, everybody should sit down, please. Protocol, please, protocol, do your work, please. Nigeria, His Excellency Ernest Bayer Koroma, the former president of Sierra Leone, the special guest of honor, His Excellency the Vice President of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Asubonjo, our host, the Executive Go Governor of Kano State, His Excellency Abdullahi Omar Ganduje, and, and all executive governors present, and our celebrant, Aswaju Ahmed Bola Tinubu, you're welcome, sir. Welcome again to the 12th Bola Tinubu Colloquium, holding in the beautiful Kano city around the world. And we had a break of transmission due to COVID-19. The event that used to be physical event has changed into a hybrid one, and thousands and thousands of people are joining us virtually by Zoom webinar and live temperature. Here at the Tinubu Colloquium, we convoying not only in honor of Bola Tinubu and his birthday, but also to exchange ideas to shape our nation and people. Our theme of the colloquium this year is our, bond, our common bond, our common wealth. I would like to, uh, my name is Buffa Sali, and with me is- Stephanie Oneshi Adams, you're welcome. We will be your program guides today. Our first order of business will be welcome note by his host, by the host, His Excellency Dr. Omar 
Ganduje, Governor of Kano State. We, you are welcome, sir. You're welcome to talk, sir. For the welcome address, please put your hands together for the Governor of Kano State, His Excellency, Governor Abdullahi Omar Ganduje. The President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Muhammad Buhari, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the Senate President the right speaker, Federal House of Assembly, who have joined us virtually, and those who are here with us in Coronation Hall, Kano, the chairman of our great party, and the governor of Yobe State, the celebrant, our leader, Senator Gola Ahmed Tunubu, members of National Assembly who are here with us, members of Kano State Executive Council who are here with us, all dignitaries who are here with us in this hall. You are most welcome to this very important occasion. It is an honor for me to deliver this welcome speech on the 12th Bola Tinubu Ahmed Colloquium, which is marking his 59th birthday. It's a very important occasion, and I feel honored. Let me recognize some panelists and discussants who have joined us all over the world and all over the country. His Excellency, Dr. George Weir, President of the Republic of Liberia, his Excellency, Dr. Ernest Bai Koroma, former President of the Republic of Sierra Leone. Her Excellency, Madam Finda Koroma, the Vice President of ECOWAS Commission. <laughs> Professor Danny Rod Roderick of Ford Foundation, Mr. Mohammed Yahya, resident representative of the United Nations Development Program. We all thank you for joining us in celebrating the 69th birthday of our leader, of our brother, Senator Tenubu Ahmed. We are very grateful for all of you. We thank you for choosing Kano to be the venue, the main venue of this occasion. Kano State is the commercial nerve center of the northern part of this country. And by the grace of God, with the development brought to Kano State by Mr. President, Kano State is now the commercial nerve center of even some West African countries. The choice of this year's topic 
of discussion. That is our common bond, our common wealth, the imperative of national cohesion for growth and development. This topic is heavily loaded. This topic is a challenge to the politicians, to the elites, even to the ordinary men in Nigeria. This topic has exposed our level of national integration. If the right indicators are to be used to measure our level of national integration from top to bottom, we can conveniently say that that level is very low. So it is a challenge for politicians, a challenge for the elites, elites and even a challenge for the ordinary people in order to discard those variables that are bringing national integration level low. Issues of tribalism, religious intolerance, nepotism, suspicion among the elites, all these variables, unless if we come together, they will continue to pull us down. His Excellency, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, we believe he is very serious, he is committed to the unity of this country, but he alone cannot win the war. We have to put our heads together in order to believe that our Nigeria is only one Nigeria. In fact, if we are to assess ourselves, all Nigerians, as far as national integration is concerned, we must be born again. And this is the stage that has been laid. I believe the resolutions that will emanate from this colloquium will form good ideas for the benefit of our policymakers, for the benefit of our politicians. With these short remarks, I do sincerely congratulate the Jagaba of Borugu, Jagaba of Nigeria, and Jagaba of Africa. Happy birthday. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for His Excellency, the Governor of Kano State. I'd like to recognize the presence of the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Honorable Speaker Femi Bajabiamila, who is joining us virtually. Please put your hands together for him. Also, I'd like to recognize the presence of Senate President, Distinguished Senator Ahmed Lawan, who will be joining us virtually. Please put your hands together for him. Now let's make welcome our special guest of honor for today and one of the primary minds behind the Bola Tinubu Colloquium. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshubanjo, will now make his remarks. The chairman of the 12th Volatinobu Colloquium, the president commander in chief of the armed forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Mohamed Bukhari, His Excellency Dr. George Ware, President of the Federal Repub of the Republic of Liberia, His Excellency Dr. Ernest Bai Koroma, former president of the Republic of Sierra Leone. The President of the Senate, Distinguished Senator Ahmed Ibrahim Lawan. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Right Honorable Femi Bajabia Miller. 
His Excellency and our host, the Governor of Kano State, Dr. Abdullahi Umar Ganduje, and all other state governors present. The celebrant, former Governor of Lagos State, and national leader of the All Progressive Congress, Ashiwa Jubola Ahmed Tinubu, Jagaban Bogu, Jagaban of Africa, and other party chieftains present. The wife of the celebrant, Ranking Senator Yeye Oluremi Tinubu, members of the National Assembly present, the Honorable Ministers present, Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Mr. Boss Mustafa, His Highness the Emir of Bichi, Nasio Ado Bayero, and other traditional rulers present, Your Excellencies of the Diplomatic Corps, the keynote speaker, Professor Daniel Roderick, and other panelists, captains of industry, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. May I join the governor of Kano State, Governor Umar Ganduje, and others to welcome you to the 12th Bola Tinubu Colloquium. And this will be my first colloquium where I'm not physically present at the venue. Uh, as I'm sure you've already heard, several of us did the best we could from Abuja uh, to get to Kano this morning, but uh, bad weather uh, certainly uh, has g gave us so much difficulty that we're unable uh, to, to arrive there. But I want to say, I want to say that we are, I want to say that we are in uh, today in a very uh, great situation where we are able to reach you virtually. We're able to reach you using all the possible scientific innovations that enable us to, to reach you virtually. And we're extremely pleased to be able to do so today. Let me begin by saying that The colloquium has become an institution. And it is an institution in honor of an institution, Bola Ahmed Tinubu. It was Barrister Ismail Ahmed at the ninth colloquium in Abuja who said so insightfully, and I quote, there is perhaps no Nigerian leader who has been as instrumental in raising as many leaders as Ashiwaju, which explains why I gathered here today is a serving vice president, several governors, former governors, commissioners, former commissioners, honorable ministers, former ministers, local government functionaries, social agitators, top ranking journalists who can trace their careers and political trajectories to Ashiwaju's leadership. What is responsible for this phenomenon is Ashiwaju's leadership style. And it is an unusual one, especially in developing democracies. Central to that style are the following. First, a belief that development, economic, social, political development depends on enabling a contest of ideas. Whether that is within a political party or its caucuses, a cabinet meeting, or even just sitting around and thinking through a problem. By exposing his own thoughts and ideas constantly to debate and contestation, he refines his views constantly and is at the cutting edge of issues as varied as artificial intelligence, vaccines, to even what sort of legal processes or arguments will be filed in a matter in court. I remember once when he was suggesting to me that he thought uh, it was better that we should contest jurisdiction in a particular case. And so many other times when he has, in, when he has uh, introduced his own legal thoughts to a, to a matter, I've had to keep reminding him that he's not a lawyer. And of course, I'm sure you have to remind him several times that he's not many different things. Second, perhaps, and more importantly, because he is not afraid of having his ideas scrutinized, criticized by even his subordinates, is able to lead a vast array of persons 
of strong, deeply held convictions and a variety of ideologies. The third in that leadership style is that he is completely comfortable engaging across ethnic, religious, and partisan divides. It is belief that national development is only possible where we, the leaders, are constantly interrogating ideas, perspective, and, and opinions, which is what led some of us who worked with him through the years to formalize our constant debates so that on his birthday, we open up discussions on some issue or issues of national importance. So starting in 2009, which was the inaugural colloquium, we addressed the question of electoral integrity with the theme, quote, every vote must count. In 2010, uh, a theme similar to what we have this year, affirmed our belief in a United Nation. Quote, this house must stand. Then in 2011, we asked the question, and I quote, Nigeria, why isn't it working? How will it work? End of quote. In 2012, there was a, we had an exercise in retrospection and prognosis. And the theme that year was, I quote, looking back and thinking ahead, end of quote. The fifth colloquium examined the driving philosophy behind the imminent political phenomenon at the time, which was the creation of a new political party by a merger of existing political parties and its implications, the creation of the APC. The theme then was beyond mergers, a national movement for change. Then came the summit of the common man in 2014, chronicling the everyday challenges of citizens and proposals to remediate these concerns. By 2015, the theme was, and I quote, change how it will work. 2016, the focus was on the sector that contributes the highest to our GDP, agriculture. The theme was, and I quote, agriculture, action, work, revolution, end of quote. The spirit of Nigerian enterprise was on display in 2017 with the make it in Nigeria theme, make it in Nigeria in 2017. In 2018, it was investing in people to examine the shape and substance of Africa's largest social investment program, the National Social Investment Program. In 2019, we addressed the question of employment and productivity under the rubric of, and I quote, work for the people, work for people. Regrettably, in 2020, as we all know, uh, where we were meant to showcase innovative ideas in education, but had to cancel on account of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're here today to engage at another of those crucial points in our national journey. At a time when a combination of challenges worsened by the fallouts of a global pandemic has created a storm of socioeconomic problems. The default mode of some at times like this is to stoke tendencies, viewpoints, and opinions that threaten the Federation and our unity. But the colloquium, as usual, bets on Nigeria and its creative and resilient people. Our theme this time is our common bond, our common wealth, focuses on peace, and we focus on peace building and national cohesion. We intend to interrogate from a national and regional perspective innovative strategies for sustaining peace and prosperity in a heterogeneous society. We believe that we now have an opportunity to increase the numbers of a new tribe of Nigerians, a tribe of men and women of all faiths, tribes, and ethnicities committed to run a country on high values of integrity, hard work, justice, and love of country a tribe of men and women who are prepared to make the sacrifices and self-constraints that are crucial to building a strong society, who are prepared to stick together, to fight for equity and justice side by side, a tribe consisting of professionals, businessmen, politicians, religious leaders, and all others who believe that this new Nigeria is possible and that already this and already we have built and are building the building blocks for this new Nigeria. As I close, let me say how deeply indebted we are to His Excellency the Governor of Kano State, the Governor Omar Ganduje, 
Only a few days ago, we were set to have a completely virtual colloquium with a hub in Lagos, the customary location of the colloquium. When Governor Ganduje graciously offered to host the physical aspect of the hybrid colloquium. By this gesture, Governor Ganduje has helped us to tell two stories. The first is that this is the first time that the colloquium is being hosted outside Lagos or Abuja, the capital city. And it is befitting that Kano should be that place. This is the city of radical and progressive ideas and ideologies, a city whose leading political lives have always been left of center which is the dominant tendency within our great party, the APC. Second, it helps us to underscore the point that this country and its people are stronger and more powerful together than apart. For the purveyors of breaking up into small components, into small countries, perhaps they should be reminded that we would not have been able to accept Governor Ganduje's offer to come to Kano at short notice, since we would all have needed visas to come to Kano. Let me also thank our brothers, His Excellency George Ware, President of Liberia, and His Excellency Dr. Ernest Baikoroma, former President of Sierra Leone, who very kindly consented to participate and share their thoughts and experiences on the implications of conflict. I assure you, uh, may I, as I have done in the past 12 years, pray for you that the Lord God Almighty will help you. That as your days, so shall your strength, so shall your wisdom, and so shall your favor with God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Please give a round of applause to our able Vice President, Professor Yomir Oshibojo. Thank you so much. And now the chairman of the colloquium and the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for President Muhammadu Buhari, the Grand President and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal The President of the Republic of Liberia, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, former President of the Republic of Sierra Leone, the State Governors present, members of the National Assembly, Secretary to the Government of the Federation, the Chief of Staff, Honorable Ministers, Vice President of the ECOWAS Commission, Development Partners, members of, of the academia and private sector, senior government officials, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me start with a very warm congratulatory message to our dear Aswajibola Ahmed Tinubu on his 69th birthday. As always, we wish for you today the best of health, happiness, strength, and wisdom as you continue onward in the service of humanity. I also facilitate with Yeye Asuaju, Senator Mrs. Olurimi Tunubu, and the rest of the family on this very joyous occasion. I think this colloquium is a fitting reflection of the service that Asuaju has given not only to Lagos State, but to Nigeria and Africa, as well as his continuing commitment and influence as one of the great players of our party, the All Progressive Congress. 
Equally, I salute all those who have kept this colloquium culture alive and thriving, making it a rich source of wisdom in our common cost for a better world and, of course, a greater Nigeria. Today's event promises an even more relevant and impactful discussion than ever before. The theme for this 12th edition, our common bond, our common wealth, the imperative of national cohesion for growth and prosperity speaks to a very contemporary but potentially ruinous trend, which in my view, we must all join hands to check at once. Despite occasional inter-ethnic tensions in our national history, it seems to me that we have all agreed on one point that notwithstanding our diversity of ethnicity, culture, language, and religion, Nigerians are better together, even stronger together. Aswaju himself is a known advocate of unity and cohesion in Nigeria. This has been a constant factor in his outstanding political career from the time he served in the short-lived Senate of the Third Republic to his involvement in the struggle for the actualization of the June 12 mandate of the late Chief MKO Abiola to his much acclaimed period of service as governor of Lagos State from 1999 to 2007. The ranks of Aswaju's political collaborators, whether as party members, comrades in the struggle, members of his cabinet, or his advisors, assistants and political associates have always reflected a fan Nigeria attitude. I believe all of us here can also confirm that the same outlook of us, of Aswaju Bola Ahmed Tinibu and other like minded Nigerians eventually made possible the coalition of four political parties into what we now see as our great party the All Progressives Congress. I can also relate personally to the ideals of One Nigeria. As a military officer, I have served with great comrades from all the nooks and crannies of our country. I have seen over and over again that their goodness or failings do not depend on ethnicity or religion. In the course of my career, I have also been opportuned to serve in all parts of Nigeria, seeing firsthand the enticing possibilities of a strong, united nation. More importantly, I fought for the unity of Nigeria as well as the civil war. 1967 to 1970. And I saw firsthand the unspeakable horrors of war, not just on fellow soldiers on both sides, but on the civilians, innocent children, women, and the elderly citizens that they left behind. As we all know, the peacekeeping recovery and reconstruction that followed could also not have succeeded under an atmosphere of inter-ethnic animosity. We must count our blessings in Nigeria and see in them 
the crucial factors of peace and unity. I think the lessons of this colloquium are clear. Our very best course of conduct, whether as leaders and citizens, is to now ensure that justice and harmony reigns in Nigeria, to devote the resources of our country solely to its development and for the benefit of all our citizens, and in the process to ensure that every Nigerian feels comfortable in every part of Nigeria. We all have a stake in the Nigeria project. And while playing our respective parts in its unity, peace, and progress, we must constantly keep faith with the promise of a greater Nigeria. I would like once again to thank our distinguished speakers and all participants at this colloquium today. I also congratulate Aswajibola Ahmed Tinubu, not only for his birthday today, but for the deep realm of constructive thought that this event has taken us to. It is a mark of true statesmanship that your birthday should be hosted in Kano and celebrated in this way with friends and associates from all parts of Nigeria join in. I wish you very more years of good health and service to Nigeria. Thank you very much and God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Together once again for the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you. And now the business of the day commences proper. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, please welcome our keynote speaker, Professor Danny Roderick. Please put your hands together. The keynote speaker, Professor Danny Roderick. Danny Roderick is an award-winning economist. He's the Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Professor Roderick's research focuses on globalization, economic growth and development, and political economy. He's the recipient of numerous awards, including the inaugural Albert O. Hirschman Prize of the Social Science Research Council and the Princess of Austria's Award for Social Sciences. His work has been profiled in the Harvard Magazine, Finance and Development, Harvard Kennedy School Magazine, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and the New York Times, among others. Your, Your Excellencies, uh, dis distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, it's, it's really a great pleasure uh, for me uh, to join uh, this celebration and, and be a part of this um, uh, exchange of, of ideas um, on this day on, 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 a, on a very, very uh, important theme of uh, national uh, cohesion. Um, this is uh, a problem uh, that uh, is very much um, the, the, um, the, the theme of the day, uh, not just in, in Nigeria or in African countries, it's very much uh, a central pre preoccupation uh, the world over um, in uh, also the uh, advanced democracies um, that um, uh, sometime not so long ago, we thought um, had uh, figured out um, the problem of how to create uh, cohesive societies and, and social inclusion. Um, and yet, um, as uh, the rise of um, ethno, um, ethno nationalism and nativism and right wing uh, uh, authoritarian populism in the advanced countries um, has shown, uh, even they are um, struggling uh, with this uh, fundamental problem of social uh, cohesion. Um, countries of Africa in, in, in many ways are in a much more difficult uh, position uh, because of the multitudes of um, ethnic, uh, racial, 
um, linguistic, um, religious divisions, uh, the sort of the, the, the you know, incredibly rich um, and vast uh, mosaic of differences uh, that is both the, the richness, uh, an important source of richness and diversity uh, of the continent, uh, but also uh, can be a very, very difficult um, source of tension uh, to manage uh, in order to achieve uh, social cohesion and, and, and national cohesion. Um, what I'm going to be doing in the next um, uh, few minutes um, that's been allotted to me is talk to you a little bit about what um, modern contemporary social science uh, brings to this question of understanding uh, what are the roots of um, ethnic and linguistic divisions, um, how can we um, achieve social cohesion and um, whether in fact such divisions are, are um, um, our destiny or whether in fact we have agency um, that we can overcome them and, and um, uh, achieve a, a more common narrative and much greater inclusion. Now I have a, a number of slides that will accompany my remarks. I wonder if um, the technical people uh, will allow me uh, to, to share my, my, my slides, to share my screen. So I don't know if, if um, uh, right now I cannot do it, but uh, if, they, if they make me a co-host, I will be able to, uh, to, to share my, my screen. Um, can we, um, I'm just gonna wait here for, for a second to see if I can, um, if uh, the technical staff will allow me to share my screen by making me a co-host. Ah, there we go, okay. So um, let me get my presentation up and, and running. Okay, wonderful. Um, let me let me start with the um, with a, a kind of a very general. Uh, finding um, a, a statistical regularity um, that um, um, uh, that countries that are uh, much more diverse or fragmented uh, in terms of ethnic uh, linguistic um, groups, uh, those countries uh, tend to perform uh, worse in terms of um, economics. And, uh, and here I have two different indicators of economic performance. One of them is, is a measure of, of the extent of poverty. Uh, the, other, the other is a measure, a broader measure of uh, the intensity of deprivation within societies. Um, and, uh, and, and the general uh, message that comes out from looking at, at scatter plots like this across different nations uh, is that uh, countries that, that are much uh, more fractionalized in terms of ethnic groups, countries that with much greater um, ethnic heterogeneity uh, tend to um, have um, higher levels of poverty and deprivation, um, lower levels of economic growth, lower levels of productivity and income and so forth. And if you look at these uh, charts closely, uh, you will note that unfortunately or uh, in this particular context that, that many African countries are on the Northwest corner uh, of these charts um, uh, that, and there's a sense that, um, that such ethnic and linguistic heterogeneity has been especially costly in Africa uh, with its mosaic of ethnicities, uh, tribes, languages, um, and, and, and religions. And in fact, there is a, a very significant uh, literature uh, that makes this point in a number of different ways uh, that ethnic, religious, linguistic heterogeneity um, has a number of adverse effects. Um, first, at the level of social outcomes in terms of um, promoting uh, discrimination, racism, uh, and promoting low levels of social trust and social cooperation. Um, uh, secondly, that, um, that uh, a consequence a consequence is much greater social conflict and, and under provision of collective goods and cooperation over economic policy uh, that generates uh, low economic growth, much greater inequality, poor economic performance. 
And that uh, ultimately also at the level of, of politics um, that these, di these divisions uh, drive um, ethno-national chauvinism, a very divisive kind of politics. Um, and as I'll come back to um, a nativist or, or right-wing kind of populism uh, so that, that uh, these divisions can be a source of poor social outcomes, poor economic outcomes and, and very, very bad politics. Um, what I want to um, answer is the question of whether, in fact, um, such uh, results, uh, such um, uh, consequences are the direct effect of um, these ethnic linguistic uh, differences and heterogeneity, or whether, in fact, they might be more related to the kinds of things that, in fact, might be under our control how we manage economic inequality, how we manage economic shocks, um, where people live in terms of residential segregation, and how these differences are exploited by political groups and political parties for their own uh, narrow ends. Because if the answer uh, is that the consequences, the adverse consequences of these are much more things that are under our own control uh, that we can do better at, then in fact, um, we can overcome uh, what might seem like uh, adverse consequences that are unavoidable. So let me start with, with the first of these uh, items, which is um, the inequalities, the inequality in incomes uh, of different uh, ethnic groups. So um, the inequalities in, uh, uh, in income across uh, different ethnic groups are, are correlated with ethnic um, fractionalization heterogeneity. That's what this first chart on the left-hand side shows. Um, and that um, this ethnic inequality is also correlated with low levels of economic development. So what I'm saying is, is that, that one of the mechanisms through which um, ethnic and, and linguistic um, uh, fragmentation and heterogeneity might produce adverse economic outcomes is not perhaps the effect of this heterogeneity, uh, but only to the extent that this differentiation comes with actually very vast inequalities uh, in economic outcomes. And in fact, um, uh, in, if you do the analysis and, and try to disentangle the effects of uh, inter-ethnic inequalities, from the consequences of fragmentation or heterogeneity itself, it turns out that the, the work, the bad work of causing adverse effects is really being drawn, done by ethnic inequality and not heterogeneity. This is a very important message from the literature uh, that, that what drives poor economic performance um, is going to be largely this particular kind of inequality, the inequality in the access to economic resources uh, of different ethnic, religious, uh, um, uh, and linguistic groups, rather than um, ethnic linguistic diversity or fragmentation per se. And that's a hopeful message because this inequality is something that we or governments can do something about, can do something to redress. Now, let me turn to um, another um, a, a sort of kind of a more recent phenomenon and see and, and try to relate it uh, again to our common theme of, um, uh, of, of, of uh, cohesion or lack thereof. And look at the, how the COVID crisis um, has been managed uh, in the United States and how that relates uh, to ethnic, in the case of the United States, essentially racial differences across the country. Now, um, this picture shows you um, what has happened to um, different parts of the country, counties that are racially diverse or fragmented versus counties that are racially or ethnically much more homogeneous. And the basic thing that one sees is that after the lockdowns, which is shown by that vertical blue line, after the lockdowns come into effect and a national emergency is declared in the United States, um, the uh, COVID cases and fatalities essentially rise significantly much more rapidly uh, in those parts of the country, in the counties 
with very high degrees of ethnic fragmentation. Um, and in fact, the increase um, in COVID cases and uh, COVID fatalities are actually um, don't rise a whole lot uh, in counties uh, that um, in the United States that were ethnically or racially more homogeneous, where there was very low ethnic fragmentation. Now, why might this be the case? I think it has a lot to do with, um, again, levels of social cooperation and social trust and the effectiveness of government policy. In this case, the lockdowns uh, in different um, uh, communities uh, where communities that were divided as opposed to uh, more, uh, more cohesive. But it's very interesting once again, that if you look at behind this picture of ethnic fragmentation and make another distinction that is really based on um, uh, differentiating communities or in this case, US counties as to areas between where there was low residential segregation and areas or counties where there were high levels of residential segregation, we get a very surprising result um, that the adverse effects, these cases of high fatalities, new cases, where they really rose uh, in areas with high residential segmentation, where people actually living in, in physically separated communities. And that's where you had the severe effects of COVID, that's where the lockdowns and government policy um, were significantly less effective. So it wasn't once again, um, uh, racial or ethnic differentiation or heterogeneity that mattered. It was actually whether people were mingling sufficiently together, where they were actually uh, physically separated or in fact, they were physically much more uh, integrated. And that again is a hopeful uh, message because it says that it's not the ethnic and linguistic or racial heterogeneity that matters. It's really where, uh, whether people are mingling with each other, whether they're residential segregation and geographic separation as opposed to uh, more interaction and mingling together. Um, the third area that I want to look at is um, uh, again, a sort of this recent trend of um, the rise of right-wing authoritarian populism, uh, uh, mostly in the advanced countries, but we see their echoes in many other developing, in many developing countries as well. And when we look at um, the rise of uh, populism in, in Europe and in the United States, uh, it's been especially one brand of populism, uh, which has been uh, very, um, uh, um, uh, prominent, and that's sort of the far right uh, populace. And that seems to be the manifestation, another manifestation of the, um, the same kind of, of, of syndrome of essentially uh, 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 racial resentment, uh, xenophobia, um, anti-immigrant uh, sentiment uh, that seems to be driving it. And, and once again, uh, the question arises, uh, whether um, it is, uh, again, uh, this, this um, heterogeneity uh, that's at the root of, of this um, authoritarian uh, bad kind of, of, of populism. But when we look at the evidence of where, in fact, populists have gained, uh, where far-right ethno-nationalist uh, authoritarian populists uh, have made progress and inroads, uh, we see actually a somewhat uh, different picture. Uh, what we see is that at the root of this increase, right, um, economic shocks, economic dislocations, unemployment, economic anxiety, economic insecurity, uh, driven by the forces of globalization, technological change, um, a variety of policies that weakened uh, the um, uh, support for uh, middle class workers, um, that these fundamentally economic and technological shocks are what have aggravated uh, these uh, social, spatial, and cultural divisions in society. And they do so essentially through two mechanisms. One is that when local communities feel economically more anxious, insecure, more threatened, there is a tendency, a psychosocial tendency of the uh, you know, sort of withdrawing inwards towards your traditional identity. 
And secondly, um, a response of heightened mistrust for outgroups, groups that have a different skin color, different religion, or might speak a different kind of a, of, 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 of a language. So these economic shocks um, can stoke uh, these um, uh, nativist or more cultural or racial uh, responses. And it's been made significantly worse uh, by the response that political leaders, uh, far right par parties um, have um, exhibited in response to these fundamental economic anxieties. And they have stoked uh, these uh, racial, cultural, uh, xenophobic tendencies by promoting a kind of a, um, a, a nativist, ethno-nationalist narrative uh, that play into uh, these divisions and therefore magnify uh, these divisions. And the question there arises as to whether therefore uh, democracies might be at a disadvantage in handling uh, these divisions. And once again, uh, I think the, the message uh, from the research uh, is much more hopeful that in fact, if anything, um, we find that uh, democracies are better at handling these divisions uh, than authoritarian regimes. We know that on average, uh, participatory democracies produce much greater economic stability. Um, uh, on average, they produce greater economic growth. Um, they are much better avoiding large mistakes and they respond to external shocks, whether it's terms of trade shocks or it's um, health pandemics, um, uh, uh, much better. And this counts for a lot more, especially in societies that might be divided by these um, uh, latent um, ethnic uh, and, 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 and racial uh, divisions. Africa itself, I think, provides uh, two important examples where this is true. Uh, the two uh, sort of longest um, uh, and most robust democracies in Africa um, have been, according to a number of international indicators, cross-national indicators in terms of um, uh, democratic, um, how democratic countries are, are, are the island of Mauritius and, and, and Botswana. And these are, for, these are also two countries that for the most part um, have actually done extremely well uh, in terms of economic development, economic growth, uh, even though uh, they started uh, from rather inaus inauspicious beginnings. Uh, Mauritius, just prior to independence, was, um, uh, um, was wrecked by um, inter-ethnic uh, conflict, and few people thought um, that Mauritius was actually going to be able to overcome uh, those ethnic and racial uh, divisions. Uh, instead, uh, good leadership and democratic participation uh, subsequently helped ameliorate uh, ethnic conflict in Mauritius as it has in, in Botswana. Uh, in Botswana, for example, traditionally the main political parties have been much more encompassing of different tribal groups and the main cleavage along which electoral and political conflict has taken place uh, has been a kind of an urban rural cleavage rather than a cleavage that divides different ethnic groups from, from each other. So to the extent that political conflict is not you know, aligned, does not align neatly with ethnic and linguistic or tribal lines, then you can have um, a more cohesive societies. Interestingly, in both of these cases, in Mauritius and Botswana, um, uh, ethnic conflicts uh, did flare in the late 1990s, in the second half of the 1990s, but interestingly, as a largely as a result of failures of economic policy management in these countries to uh, adequately respond to economic shocks and inequalities um, that was created in the second half of the 1990s. So once again, uh, we get to the importance of being able to manage shocks. Uh, and if we don't perform that well, uh, then uh, that might uh, flare, result in, in flaring up of ethnic tensions. Um, another recent example of the uh, relative superiority of democratic forms of governance uh, in responding uh, uh, shocks has been that when we look at the effectiveness of government policies uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, what we find is that countries with more democratically accountable governments 
um, have, even though they introduced less stringent lockdowns than more authoritarian regimes, have ag experienced approximately uh, much larger declines in geographical mobility at the same level of policy stringency. So that once again, that speaks to the ability of more participatory regimes uh, to generate greater uh, social trust, greater uh, faith in the ability of the government, uh, more ability of government to actually enforce its decisions uh, compared to authoritarian regimes, even though they may seem uh, hard um, uh, uh, on, on, on paper. But it's extremely important, I think, to emphasize that when we talk about uh, democracy, um, we uh, mean much more than elections. Democracies are not just electoral democracies, they ought to be also liberal democracies. And what a liberal democracy is essentially not just you know, a, a regime where you have elections every four years or five years, but also a regime that actually enforces civil rights, civil liberties, the rule of law, non-discrimination uh, in the application of the laws and in the provision of public goods. So that's very important to emphasize. Uh, that democracy is not only about elections. It's also about protecting the rights of the minority, including the rights of ethnic and, and religious minorities. So I come to the, to the end um, uh, of, of, my, of my remarks. Um, uh, the, the point is that social conflict is not destiny as much as um, our societies might be um, uh, divided. Uh, by along ethnic, religious, linguistic um, uh, lines or tribal lines, uh, that these consequences of ethnic and, and, and tribal heterogeneity are not a given, that they are moderated or potentially offset uh, by um, uh, inter-ethnic equity on the economic dimension, much greater spatial integration, uh, our ability to manage economic shocks better, and finally, perhaps, more, most importantly, by following policies, politics on the part of our leadership that is more encompassing uh, rather than uh, uh, dividing. Um, and I think um, I've told you things that you presumably, or, um, uh, but it's very nice. Uh, you should be comforted to know that uh, contemporary social science backs up uh, these very important um, uh, uh, intuitions and that gives us different areas where we can exercise leverage uh, in uh, generating much greater social cohesion and greater levels of na national cohesion. Thank you very much uh, for, for listening to me and uh, I, I, I wish you a productive discussion uh, for the rest uh, of the colloquium. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Roderick Danny, for that insightful uh, keynote. Maybe we haven't memorized our past present enough, how we were carved, joined, and born. A hundred years and more of who we have been and where we have walked. Sixty years and counting of liberty and ceremonies of silence and uttered words. We can now tell the stories as history or not. A tale of strife, coups, and then a civil war. Mostly, we might not like the places they take us, but the great and all the anonymous dead are there. And here, they cannot watch history repeat itself. Hear the sounds of all the sounds we brought on ourselves. The stillborn and the young, tongue versus tongue, and creed versus creed. Helmets, boots, guns, hunger, conscription, and deprivation. The sour taste of it all still lingers on our tongues, but is fading from our memory. But where are we going to be? And why? And who? 
Those long gone, young and unborn want to know, do we mean to be the people we meant to be? To keep on going where we meant to go? Gentle, but forceful and graphic reminders of the sordid details of conflict. The evidence from our neighbors teaches a lesson we partook in as peacekeepers. In the 90s, we sent men to Liberia, to Sierra Leone, and have witnessed the gory sight of it all for these nations, their citizens, and children. To rebuild a monumental effort, stone and slab, brick and mortar, and the human psyche. Rwanda leave out a nightmare in short bursts. Libya and Syria still linger in war after a decade. But how do we fashion the future today? How do we address the commonplaceness of conflict and estrangement intrinsic in human exchange? I have rights. You have rights. We all have rights, not just situational, but constitutional and God-given. The right to life, to move, fair hearing, personal liberty, dignity, and my dreams and thoughts. Who would have thought that no one would be responsible? No one responsible enough to be responsible for our safety, security, prosperity, welfare, and our dreams. Hear a chant from the young, perhaps we are responsible only to the extent that there is reason and thought. So we ask, can human faculties overcome estrangement? Can conflict be overcome by reason? Are there relatives or absolutes, uniformity or organic unity in diversity? Do we approve of a revolutionary attitude? or at a minimum, employ a revolutionary rhetoric. Extremism infused with intolerance and self-righteousness might lead to a greater evil than those it attacks. How can divisions and conflicts among men and women be moderated? Existing social and political institutions may be imperfect, but insofar as they assure some kind of order, they have great value. Democracy should not be found in parties, but between parties. We, who are many people together, cannot become the people falling apart. We, who dream for every child and even chance, cannot let luck alone send children to school. We, whose law was never so much of the hand as the head, cannot let chaos make its way to the heart. We who have seen learning struggle from teacher to child cannot let ignorance spread itself like rot. We who have seen rumors in Gulf villages cannot stand idly by as disinformation propaganda crawl the web to inflame our nation. We know what needs doing and saying. We know we need growth and jobs. But grow we shall, even if in degree by slow degree, believing ourselves toward all we have tried to become just and compassionate, equal, able, and free. So it is held not in accepting our lot as a nation, but in reforming it. All groups must come together to reason together a cohesion of the human faculty of reason to develop a thoughtful community and not in one that remains what it has always been, but one that comes together in a reforming community, a community that is imperfect, but can gradually perfect itself. This is our common bond. This is our common wealth. Absolutely insightful. Thank you so much. Now we're going to check on our audience in Lagos. Uh, it looks like everybody is just having so much fun without our audience in Lagos. So can you please take us to Lagos virtually? Temple would like to see our audience in Lagos. Okay, our, our audience in Lagos. Hello, everyone. All right, Temple, please take us our audience in Abuja. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, we'll also like to recognize everyone joining us virtually across the globe. Please put your hands together for everyone out there. And now to the panel discussion. 
The Bolotinibu Colloquium is a convergence of ideas on the specific issue that is put forward every given year. We know that there is a myriad of perspectives on the question of conflict and cohesion. To do justice to these viewpoints are our panelists, drawn from the regional leadership, academia, international development agencies, consulting, and civil society. To moderate our panel is Mr. Geoffrey Onyema, the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Now to our panel. Here are our panelists. His Excellency, Dr. Enes Bai Kuruma, born on 2nd of October, 1953, served as the fourth president of Sierra Leone from 17 September 2007 to 4th April 2018. He spent more than 24 years working in the private insurance industry before entering politics in 2002. From 1988 to 2002, he was the managing director of the Reliance Insurance Trust Corporation. He earned a bachelor's degree from Fura Bay College in 1976. He was instrumental in rebuilding the country's national infrastructure after the Civil War, fighting corruption and improving the country's healthcare system. Dr. Ernest Baikoroma was elected president of Sierra Leone from 2007 to 2018, during which time he delivered long-lasting impactful reforms for the development of Sierra Leone. His reforms resulted in Sierra Leone becoming the fastest growing economy in Africa in 2014, before the outbreak of the deadly Ebola epidemic. By the end of his tenure in 2018, the Global Peace Index recognized Sierra Leone as the most peaceful country in West Africa and the third most peaceful in the African continent. This was an extraordinary accomplishment for a country that had recently emerged from an 11-year devastating civil war. The UN Secretary General described Sierra Leone as one of the world's most successful cases of post-conflict recovery, peacekeeping, and peacebuilding. Mohamed Yahya is a development practitioner with over 18 years of experience working on critical development issues such as the prevention of violence, extremism, governance, peace building, conflicts recovery, and public policy. He is the resident representative of the United Nations Development Program in the Federal Republic of Nigeria and has been in this role since June 2019. Mr. Yahya holds a master's degree in conflict and development studies and a bachelor's degree in politics and history from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Kumi Olonishaki is a professor of security, leadership, and development at King's College London. She's a founding member of the African Leadership Center, which aims to build the next generation of African scholars, generating cutting-edge knowledge for security and development in Africa. She obtained her first degree in political science at the Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife. She went on to obtain her master's degree as well as a PhD in war studies at King's College London. In 2015, Professor Olonishaki was appointed by the United Nations Secretary Secretary General Ban Ki-moon as one of seven members of the advisory group of experts on the review of the United Nations peace-building architecture. Professor Olonishaki has positioned her work to serve as a bridge between academia and the world of policy and practice. Her most recent research has focused on reframing narratives of peace and state-building in Africa and on future peace, society, and the state in Africa. Amaka Anku is a lawyer, analyst, and international development consultant. She's the director and head of Africa practice at the Eurasia Group. As head, she helps clients understand the interaction of politics, policy, and markets across sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> she has worked on development and conflict resolution in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, Senegal, South Africa, Tunisia, Gabon, and Nigeria, and for organizations such as the International Rescue Committee, Africa, the International Crisis Group, and the African Development Bank. She has published on transitional justice challenges in Rwanda and presented her work at international conferences in the United States and Europe. Amaka is a frequent commentator and speaker on Nigerian and African affairs. Amaka earned her bachelor's degree from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University and a doctor of law degree from Harvard Law School. Nim Dir Nansok is a social entrepreneur and crusader for good governance and accountability. She's the founder and CEO of Info Africa, a social enterprise that implements corporate social responsibility for individuals, companies, and organizations. She's also a project management consultant actively engaged in a series of youth development projects such as the Jaw Skills Lab, the Next Economy Africa, and several community library projects. Mr. Geoffrey Oyama, please, you have the floor now. Mr. Geoffrey Oyama, Honorable Minister, sir. Um, thank you very much indeed. 
Um, Your Excellency, um, President Mohamedou Buhari, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Your Excellency, Prof Professor Yemi uh, Oshibajo, Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Your Excellency, Abdullahi Ganduje, Governor of uh, Kanu State. Uh, Your Excellency, Asiwaju uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, uh, the Chief Celebrant, and uh, wishing you uh, many happy returns of the day, a happy birthday, and uh, all protocol observed. Uh, welcome to uh, all the panelists. Uh, this panel discussion is um, on multi dimensions of conflict on nation building and national uh, growth. Um, we have uh, three uh, members of this panel and then we'll hand over to uh, Kanu uh, for, the, um, for the other two panelists. So um, a, a warm welcome, uh, Your Excellency, uh, former president of the Republic of Sierra Leone. I will begin with you, uh, Your Excellency. I have two questions with you and you have um, about 10 minutes uh, to answer them. Uh, I will start off with the first question, uh, Your Excellency. That is your election as president of Sierra Leone was a part of the post-conflict continuum in Sierra Leone. With the benefit of hindsight today, what role could the political elite in Sierra Leone have played at the time to facilitate cohesion and diffuse the tension before it got out of hand? Over to you, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, former president. Can you hear me? Ah, it appears that um, uh, the former president of uh, Sierra Leone, um, President uh, Ernest Bai Kuroma is not online. Uh, in which case, uh, I will proceed uh, to uh, the next panelist, uh, who is um, Mohamed Yaya, the resident representative, United Nations Development Program. I hope you can hear me, uh, resident rep. Yes, minister, I can hear you clearly, thanks. E excellent, very good. Uh, so um, I have three questions for you and... Oh. Um, Hello, and about uh, three, uh, about 10 minutes in which to uh, go through them. So the first question uh, is from your experience working in Africa, what are the drivers of extremism and what are the innovative ways of preventing and responding to violent extremism? Over thank, to you. Thank you, uh, Minister, and thank you for uh, for the organizers for having me, uh, all protocols observed. Minister, I'll probably thought before I start, I will share uh, a small clip to show the viewers where the continent is in relation to violent extremism for the last 20 years. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. In it, you'll be able to see uh, each dot you see, Minister, is, uh, is an attack. Uh, by insurgency or rebels in the African continent. Uh, this shows where we've been each year. You'll see that it, it's rolling up to where we are in 2020. So if we go to 2020, in the last 20 years, each dot in the African continent represents an attack by a violent extremist group or a related insurgent uh, rebel group somewhere in the African continent. Mm -hmm. So it's really... Uh, a, a right time to discuss why this is happening, why are young Africans uh, joining violent extremist uh, groups? Why are they attacking uh, mercilessly? You probably heard about what happened in Mozambique yesterday with the attack in Mozambique uh, that affected a lot, of, uh, a lot of the economic activities. So to do this, we at UNDP actually went and started talking to these young people in six African countries to find out what happened in their life that has made them more susceptible to join violent extremism group? And we actually used the scientific process to approach this. And these are the results I wanted to share today. One is many of them 
have a geographical location in where they come from. The interesting thing is I'm just projecting, you will see Nigeria, Kenya, and Somalia uh, as three examples. Most of them come from regions in the same country that has a pre, what I call a pre-existing condition. And those pre-existing conditions are normally extreme poverty, low level of ed education, both religious and, 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 and secular education, which I'll come back to. So first story of violent extremism is a story of exclusion. And it's really important this is understood because this is the roots that the extremists, extremists grow. They tend to go to places where in what we call borderlands or areas where you have seen a generation of exclusion. Second part is the issue of education, another pre-existing condition for extremism. Uh, although many uh, uh, mentioned religious uh, education, but we find that actually 57% of them had very little religious education. Cramming the Quran or reading, the, understanding the Quran is not the same thing. And what we find in this situation is significant proportion, more than 50% had very little understanding of their own religion. And then you look at secular education is another fatal ground uh, that we see in, in the story of violent extremism in, in, in Africa. When we compare, you will see the red and, 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 and the reference group, those who did not join, and we compare to those who joined, and the results are very striking, both on religious literacy, but also secular education. That again is a, is, is a big finding of the, of, the, of the report. The third part is, it's a, it's a very personal process. Uh, unlike when we compare violent extremism in the Europe where a lot of recruitment happens online, in the African context, including in Nigeria, it's a very personal process. So we wanted to know how, who made them join, who was the, the person who approached them. And the results were this across Africa. 50% are friends, somebody they trusted, somebody they knew. 17% religious organization, 7% family members, and others joined by themselves. But the majority were uh, a, a labor intensive process of recruitment. This is not internet based form of recruitment that we see in other places. So this has a significant uh, uh, result because if in the future, the African continent continues the way it's continuing without addressing those pre-existing conditions. And when our digitization becomes much more, the recruitment could most likely go higher. Then we ask them, Minister, what was the tipping point? What pushed you to the edge? And the most fascinating part majority in the African context mentioned some form of abuse. I remember interviewing some in Kenya myself, and one of the things, one of the young men told me, he remembers his mother being slapped by the police in front of him, and that was for him the, 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 the end push. Not the cause, but what pushed him over the tip. So this is what we are finding on the extremism side, but what I wanted to finish uh, 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 in terms of uh, putting all this together, one, as I said, the story of extremism is a story of exclusion. A story of extremism and the consequence of extremism is also a story of intolerable waste of talent. Many people who will otherwise have had a different opportunity, those who have suffered and others have, have, have gone. So what to do? The story, what we say from a development perspective, obviously there is the military kinetic response, which is unavoidable for the state and that is uh, accepted. But that plus actions such as removing these root causes, seeing education and education opportunity, both religious and secular, as a liberator, as a safety net or a, or a wall against extremism is a strong story that comes out of, of, of the data. And how do we address these things? I mean, everybody I know that the, uh, uh, His Excellency President uh, Buhari has made poverty as a, and removing 100 million people out of our poverty as, an, as a huge agenda uh, for, for his administration. Uh, it's always good to add to say that that is also a security imperative from what we see uh, on the data. I will finish by quoting uh, one of our gurus on, in, in the development side uh, when we say that. Uh, uh, Poverty is not just the lack of resources, but more importantly, poverty st stops somebody meeting or gives the, uh, stops them having the capability to realize their potential as a human being. 
So for us who work in development, when we tell a story of poverty, we tell a uh, story of exclusion, sooner or later, it becomes a story of insecurity and stops an entire country moving forward. Thank you very much. Very good. Th th thank you very much indeed, um, uh, resident representative. Uh, very incisive um, uh, response and observations. Uh, and I think uh, also thank you because you've covered the three questions that I had uh, for you. Um, the connection between socioeconomic conditions and violent extremism, and also the strategies uh, that you consider viable for, um, for recovery uh, from, um, from these uh, situations. So I will move um, now to um, Professor Fumi uh, Olani Shaki, uh, Professor of uh, Security Leadership and Development at uh, King's College uh, London. Uh, you're most welcome, Professor. Um, Professor, I have um, two, uh, two questions uh, for you, and I hope you can hear me well, yeah? I can, I hope you can hear me too. I can hear you very well, excellent, good. So, Prof, um, how do you find the concept of uh, trying to secure and unite a nation state from the center? Are there any benefits in a more decentralized responsibility matrix with federating units or subnational entities given more leverage to address some of the issues of security and cohesion? So you can respond to that, and then I will come to the second one if you don't address the second one. Okay. All right. No, no, thank you very much. I, I think that's really profound. I, I, and I think it's important to think about this question. I guess I want to think about this question uh, in, in two main parts. Uh, the first is to reflect really uh, about the kind of quality that is characterized by diversity. And I think the keynote speaker has spoke a lot uh, about this in terms of fragmentation, uh, ethnic fragmentation, the heterogeneity uh, that defines many of our societies in Africa. Uh, I, I want to argue very strongly that there's huge value in the focus on securing binding mutuality between those that are governing and uh, the, entire, uh, the entirety of the population around values uh, and a vision that people share in common across the society, whilst allowing individual differences to be held uh, and managed uh, by, sub, uh, by subnational entities without thinking about the individuals, the, the specificities and the reality of, the, of those subnational uh, entities uh, and dealing with that as something that is within, uh, you know, the, the, the remit of our own shared values and our shared vision of security. Without dealing with those things in an interrelated way, it is so difficult uh, to, to think about the kind of peace uh, and stability that is sustainable. Uh, more often than not, there's a tendency to think about military security as an indicator of a strong uh, United Nation state and that this has to be held uh, so strongly to by a center. But, but, but research has shown, and we now know for a fact that many countries, not just African countries, many countries globally, uh, in, in those countries, the state struggles uh, to hold the monopoly of the means of violence. And they're very rare exceptions. Not even in the United States do you have, uh, you know, does the state have the monopoly over the means of, of violence? No, is it even possible as something to pursue so exclusively uh, when we're pursuing a uh, stable peace. So, so in the second, uh, in my second part, in an attempt to answer this question, I think three key questions are important. When we want to deal with this whole issue of the center, uh, what you keep in the center and in the subunits. First question is, is there clarity around a shared vision uh, that holds across all divides and around which the whole the whole uh, of a society will cohere when it comes to governing life in common. Because if we, if we cannot govern life in common, we cannot expect uh, to build and sustain peace. So finding it means that we found a mission. So to sustain a national vision and a national culture that is meaningful for the whole that gives everyone a sense of belonging means dealing with all of those questions of insecurity uh, across the board. And I think that there's a huge role for subnational units. Without a conflict, 
So, so in a sense, uh, you know, my sense of my own Nigerianness should not be in conflict with my Benoiness or my Ekitiness, if you like. It's important to find a national vision and a coherent narrative, but it's also important to allow subunits to take their own destinies into their hands in pursuit of their own specific uh, situation. And I think many countries struggle to find this kind of balance because there's a sense that if the weakness, if the center does not hold on tightly, uh, you know, to that kind of perceived strength, then it is read as a weakness. Second question is whether sub-national identities and entities themselves, you know, can mutually hold goals among those people that reflects the reality of the situation. There, there's still question marks around this in many countries, in many cases, so that uh, sub-national entities themselves need to thrive. And if they thrive, you can find that affecting the center uh, as a whole. I, I, I think, those are the two major questions. For the third question, therefore, is on what terms are you going to build a mutual pursuit, an interdependent pursuit of an identity at the local subnational level that allows you to enrich uh, the national identity? And I feel that many African countries and many African states did not have a chance to have a conversation about the terms on which they will live together. And in es essentially, we have been holding on to colonial instruments to try to govern life in common for a brand new generation. And those colonial instruments themselves were meant to subjugate. And that's what we have found uh, across much of the continent. So that a, a series of conversations have to be had to make this possible. Let me leave it okay. at that. You've, um, you've, um, yeah, you anticipated to a certain extent this, uh, the second question I was going to ask you, so you might not need to dwell too long on it, but in your article on uh, shifting ideas of sustainable peace uh, towards conversation in state building, uh, that was the article you, you, you wrote, you suggested that the pursuit of peace must account for the depth of conversation about the presence, absence, or desire for peace as well as accompanying perspectives of state building across the target society. So what type of framework would you suggest for a reasoned conversation or dialogue to occur in a systemic basis in Nigeria? As I said, you've anticipated to a certain extent, but you can now fill in. No, no, thank you. I think, that, I think that's an excellent question. I, I thank you very much for that. I, I think what I was alluding to, you've given me a chance to expand on it a little bit. The notion of conversation itself has to come to a 21st century place um, in order to help societies thrive. We have seen one form of conversation. And in that research that led to this article you were talking about, we looked at Rwanda, Ethiopia, uh, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, and Kenya. And we saw all manner of intervention in their own processes of peace building. But what becomes clear is that our centralized and our own globalized, if you like, a liberal approach to peace building has always seen one mainstream conversation going on, um, all, all right, in which it is elite actors on all sides talking openly, using the mainstream spaces, you find externals or very credible internals helping to mediate these spaces. But by and large, and that's the argument, a country as diverse as Nigeria needs to really look across our entire terrain for the conversations that are going on. I don't mean this kind of conversation that we're having as entirely groupings now, but the, there's a range of conversation. I will refer to this as a conversable spaces, the sites in which these conversations are going on. I rarely looked at when you look at mainstream peace building attempts. And very quickly, those sites, these conversable spaces have mainstream form like what we're doing now, try to debate amongst ourselves about what the best path uh, to a sustainable future might be. But you begin to then see the sites in which there's nothing but silence. And we are arguing that silence is a very important conversation. If we can't ask who's around the table or who's invisible in this picture, we will not see the zones of silence that characterize many of our societies. And Nigeria is not alone. Those whose voices are not heard, 
those who are dispossessed in many, in many ways and therefore look for options. We've just been talking about terrorism. These are the factors at the heart of it. Whose, whose voice is not represented? Where and how are those voices expressed? Violence is a part of the conversation. So the conversation we're talking about is the state is always talking or we as elite, we're always talking and we know how to talk in overt ways in mainstream places, but we don't look for where silence is so profound and is very loud. We only notice when there's violence and we need to understand that the violence itself is a core part of the conversation because society is talking back to us. And we need to ask about the violence in those places. Why do some citizens choose to pursue the conflict within themselves or with the state and the elite so violently? What are they saying through that? And that's been the story of Boko Haram and all of these other actors across the continent of Africa. Like I said, this, you know, I, we studied other African countries and you saw this. Protests on streets and squares. And you notice that our youth now use protests more, whether you're thinking of Burkina Faso, Senegal, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, across the board. What are they saying? But, but penultimately the social space of new media. It is congested and it is both unifying and dividing in its potential. What conversation going on there is an essential part of how we find sustainable peace. It is how Generation Z in the 21st century converses with society. And we need to understand that space. It's vital for arriving at a sustainable workplace or workable peace at the end of the day. Finally, theater, art, and, and music. We've seen that in Syria alone, in Rwanda, when it was used for violence, and it's also been used to build peace in Sierra Leone as a peace building tool. In Nigeria, look at Nollywood and all of that. There are underlying narratives about really the human condition of our country and of our continent, which I think is what we need to look for first in order to build life in common. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Very, very incisive. And I think uh, the, the takeaway um, take yes, there will be uh, Giorgio. Can you hear not, me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, Dr. Enes Baikoroma is back online, sir. Ah, okay, very good. Um, you're welcome back, um, Your Excellency. Can you hear me, Your Excellency? Your Excellency, can you hear me? It looks like we lost him again. We have a connectivity issue, sir. Okay, very quickly, um, as we wait for him to maybe try and reconnect, let me um, ask, um, I hope he's still online, um, the resident representative of the UNDP, uh, Mohamed Yaya, are you online? Yes, I'm here. Ex excellent. So uh, just one more question I wanted to ask you. Um, what strategies uh, do you consider viable for post-conflict recovery, for nation building and national growth? So what strategies do you think viable for post-conflict recovery for nation building and national growth? Um, thanks, Honorable Minister. I, I will take it, uh, I, I just wanted to use an analogy, uh, uh, to the way to explain some of the problems we have in cohesion and nation building, as you put it. You know, in societies where political organization is based either on class or other form of, because political organization and democracy needs a, a, a something that brings people together. So what we tend to do in the African continent is we tend to organize people around tribe or religion or region, because that's the easiest way to associate, because if you have low level of education, you have masses of people, that is the way people are organized. In terms of rebuilding a country or building a future of a country, that it's also the reason why it's difficult to build a cohesive future of a country. In East Africa, where we have a lot of lions, what we say is it's easy to ride a lion because it takes you very far, but you can't get off the lion because it will eat you. And that is the problem with how nation building or uh, recovery is done. For society to move forward, and I think the professor just said uh, eloquently, you need a different form of societal organization where everybody feels that they have a stake. And stake doesn't mean sharing of the cake. Stake means that services are provided, 
opportunity, ladders of opportunity exist. And if that doesn't exist, then the entire recovery agenda becomes uh, what we used to call in the old days, a, a, a beep before the next conflict. And I really like the way the professor put it in essentially that conflict is also a response by society. And when I was doing the presentation on, 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 on terrorism, one thing with the word terrorism is we assume the terrorists come from Jupiter. And we don't want to admit that the terrorists come from our society. They are our sisters, they are our brothers, they're us. So how do we deal with that? I think the, 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 the problem is we have a two clashes between how politics is organized in a poor society with what needs to, be de- needs to be done for society to move forward. Sometimes those two are mutually exclusive. So for my experience, I've worked in Afghanistan, I've worked in Liberia uh, during the conflict and other places. You always come back to the issue of what kind of leadership can inspire a society to think beyond the today and the tomorrow. And any society that is based on a tenets of inclusion, diversity, celebrating that diversity, then the problem of, 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 of a future recovery agenda shouldn't be that uh, complex, in my opinion. Excellent, very good, excellent. Um, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, is uh, by any chance former President uh, Ernest Bai Koroma online? So um, it appears we cannot um, get the connection with the former president. So um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, very, very much indeed, um, Mohamed Yaya, the resident representative of the United Nations Development Program uh, here in Nigeria uh, for his very, very uh, insightful and incisive um, uh, comments and uh, observations, as well as Professor Fumi uh, Alani Shaki, uh, Professor of Security Leadership and Development at King's College uh, London, uh, also for her very trenchant and incisive uh, uh, observations and, uh, and comments. Thank you very much for sharing those with us. Uh, now for the other two panelists, um, Amaka Anku and uh, Nimdia uh, Nanso, I will be passing you, I will be passing on to um, the, uh, the moderator uh, in Kano uh, to, um, to take over now. So I hope that can be done seamlessly. Thank you very much, sir. You, thank you very much for taking the first part of the uh, panel. Um, and we, th- we also thank the first uh, panels that, uh, that, that joined us. Um, Mrs. Amaka, are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, so we're gonna go straight to our, to our question. Um, from, you, from an investment perspective, what might be three key indicators to demonstrate that a country is taking steps to negate the effects of internal fault lines in a country. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank, thank you to all the distinguished guests, all protocols observed. Um, so I, I just want to talk about three, three key things that I see as the things that investors, my clients are looking at, right? And it's all interconnected, right? So one, it's domestic confidence, um, it's tax mobilization, revenue, and then production of ideas, okay? So starting from the first one, domestic confidence, I think this is one of the most underrated, underrated issues, right? In the sense that if you, if your locals are not interested in investing in the country, then why should foreigners invest, right? What are the things that drives domestic confidence? It's trust in institutions, it's accountability, and it's justice. And then very importantly, it's communications, which is the third thing I will also talk about, right? And so, you know, accountability. Um, As long as all of the issues that a lot of people have been talking here today, ethnic inequality, right? The sense that everybody should feel they have a stake. All of those things you will not have, all all of those things also impact domestic confidence, which impacts the locals tendency or or desirability to invest in the country, which then impacts whether foreigners want to invest, right? And all of those things won't exist if you don't have, if if there is a, a broad perception that there is a lack of accountability, from the people at the top, 
from the people who control state state power um, or justice, right? If if people are, you know, if police officers are shooting people and they don't get prosecuted, that contributes to a, a, a broad sense of injustice, which also impacts domestic confidence. And then most importantly, and this leads to my second point, is the state, right? The role of the state in ensuring those, those things. One of the most dangerous ideas in Nigeria is that the Nigerian state is too big, right? That it's, it's too large and it's incompetent. Um, the, it, the Nigerian state is actually dangerously small, right? There are not enough police officers to actually ensure security. A lot of you know, vast areas of the country are under-policed, under-resourced. Um, I mean, you know, we need to pay judges more and better. We need better training. We need more social services. All of those things need bigger government more government, more competent government, but all of those things also need revenue, revenue, right? Tax revenue. And that, that is one of the things that um, investors are also looking at because it, it's a signal, it's a sign of state capacity, right? And, you know, as, as people know, most, a lot of people know, um, Nigeria only collects about 8% um, of its economic activity in revenues whereas the average in sub-Saharan Africa is about 15%. So this is a, an extremely important imperative that people are looking at, right? Um, and I, you know, that there's been a lot of discussion about that in, in recent years, that this is a priority to really collect re revenues in Nigeria. It's, a, it's an extremely important issue. Um, and then to the, to, the third, to the third point, right? Which is communication and the production of ideas and a part of what we're doing here today. Again, an extremely underrated issue, but one, one that really can frame, frame these issues and bring people out, along. So there, there is a very little, and I think all Nigerian governments have underestimated the importance of communication, constantly engaging with the citizenry, right? And, and encouraging sort of an informed discussion and debate about issues, creating a shared, a, a shared vision, right? And that's, you know, that's, that sometimes comes from government. So there's one angle of it can come from government just in terms of, um, you know, speaking more to people, like in a, a, a lot of countries, we have the State of the Union address, we have, you know, weekly presidential addresses or, you know, different kinds of things. Um, but there's also, so there's that, but it's, it's extremely important. And what a lot of what investors are, are, are looking for is a holistic framing of what exactly are the policies, how exactly are we trying to achieve them, right? And then on the other side, from, from civil society, again, something that I, that investors are also looking at, but, you know, they, you know, a, a, a production of ideas that, that also challenge government and that create more ideas about where we should go, how we should be organized, you know, what are, what are the ideas that, that bind Nigeria together, right? What are the ideas? What is a Nigerian dream? Um, none of, you know, what is the, there's very little substantive ideas, discussion, intellectual production coming out of universities about, you know, how do we deal with, you know, herder pharma conflicts, all of those kinds of things. Those, they seem, they don't sound like the kinds of things investors will be looking at, but they impact the perception, right, of what is the quality of the political conversation and how is that impacting governance, right? So those are, those would be the, the three things that I, I would mention are things that will show you know, raising domestic confidence, which um, feeds into justice issues, accountability issues, and then of course, tax mobilization, the size of the states, the ability of the states to ensure justice, which then raises domestic confidence and communication, not just constantly engaging from the government, but also encouraging constant engagement and a feedback loop and a support system of intellectuals on the outside who are producing ideas and supporting and encouraging and holding governments and authorities to also implement those ideas. Thank you so much, Ms. Amaka Anku. Thank you for highlighting the essence of constant communication. Um, uh, thank you so much, ma'am. I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Nimder Nansog a question. Ms. Nimder, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. To, 
follow up from what uh, Ms. Amaka said, I'd like to ask, how can the government engage and be responsive to the clamor of Nigerian youth? Based on your personal experience, can you please highlight that? Thank you. Hmm. I would say the, the first thing is for, for government to engage our youth at stakeholder level, because um, you, mu you must see the youth as stakeholders. That, that is very important. If you don't see them as stakeholders, you will lose them. And to have 43.69% of a population that is youth-based, I think you can't afford to lose touch with how important the youth are. And I think that if nothing, that there's a lesson from the NSAS movement, and that is that the Nigerian youth is ready. Okay, so when you engage with them, not as children, but as stakeholders, you don't want to pacify them, but you want to bring them to the table, okay, to get them to understand that they own the future and to engage with them. You need to engage with us because we own Nigeria, each and every one of us, whether the youth, the children, okay, the older generation, Nigeria is ours, okay, and, and if we, we just segregate the youth and disengage, then there's going to be a huge problem. So the government needs to engage at stakeholder level. And by engaging, it, it has to start from the grassroots. In fact, it has to start from the very basic level of family. Okay, you have to engage youth from the family level. Nigeria is a very religious country. You have to engage them through churches, through mosques, okay, and then through their counselors. You have to start from the grassroots counselors, from the ward levels. Every level of political representation must engage with the youth if, if you want them to be to to understand what is going on and for you to get to a middle ground with the youth. Everyone has to engage them and consider them as stakeholders. Another way is through transparency. Recently, we heard about the CBN recruitment process. And we just heard after the process was done, these are the, the issues, these are the kinds of things that that make the youth to begin to doubt the sincerity of the leadership of, of governance. So give us, engage with us, make your processes transparent, even the policies, bring us to the table, make policies with us. And when you make these policies, give us indices for measurement, let us be able to gauge you, create polls. And, and when you engage with us, ensure that you just don't engage with us because we're asking to be engaged. Engage with us and let us see the feedback. If you engage, we want to say, okay, we have agreed on this and this and this, and, and after now, we will see the results of our engagement. Don't engage with us and just go away and do what you want to do. No, the system has to be open and transparent. And thirdly, I'd say, even if Nigeria is not ready to restructure, we can work with recommendations that the Comfort gave, okay? And you see, Nigeria, we're very unique, and each, each region, the South, the East, the West, the North, we all have our very unique strengths and even unique weaknesses. And, and, and I would like to say that government should leverage on, on these strengths and then they should build on the weaknesses. What is the unique strength of the East, for instance? It's commerce and industry. The strength of the West is education and maybe aqua agriculture. I, I think I could say that. The strength of the South is oil and the North is agriculture. So harness this unique strength and build on them. Okay, spawn the weaknesses of, of each of these regions for the good of the country. And these, these solutions should be pragmatic. In the North, create more schools, make education a priority. In the South, what are their agitations? Okay, resolve these agitations. And I keep saying something that the demands of the Nigerian youth at every point, our demands are not unreasonable. But when you just assume 
or, or, or let me just say, when government assumes that we're at every point just rebels trying to to be heard for with no just cause, then there's a problem. You need to understand where we're coming from, and then we can move forward. I think that we must begin as a nation to think globally. What is happening on the global stage? I'm going to make reference to what happened with the cryptocurrency. And I, I think that the CBN should have engaged stakeholders. And by stakeholders, I mean the youth. They should be more open-minded towards the youth. And it is just going to make things a lot easier for both the leadership and the followership. And in, in, in I think that Nigerian youth are open to global systems. And so the leadership, and we're the future. So if the future is open to global leadership and inclusion and all of that, then, then the, the leadership should also smart enough to bring policies to the table and policies that are reasonable, policies that will ensure that Nigeria at every point is moving forward. And the government should not forget, stakeholders at every level should not forget that the youth, we see Nigeria as our own. So whenever we want to speak about Nigeria, we're speaking because we want it to be better, not because we just want to be rebuilt. Thank you. Please put your hands together for Ms. Nimdir Namsok. She says, the demands of Nigerian youth are imperative. Therefore, there is a need for constant communication. Thank you so much. We have now finished the thematic discourse and we move over to the second segment where we pay tribute to the celebrant, Asiwaju Bola Tinubu. To start things off, we have curated his ideas and thoughts in an animation presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy. The one who asked me to look at the face of uh, three women who were in need of money to pay their work fee for their children. That touched me, not the amount of money that I put out of my pocket, but then and then, I was a governor, and I have to start the policy of paying for YEC fee for all the children, whether rich or poor, in Lagos State. We sit down, don't tell us, do you know them? Let's help them. We can't do it. We have the resources, we have the land area, we have the land mass, we have the vegetation. The great quality of leadership is the ability to convince his followers, his team, it's admire that courage, courage and determination is omnipotent. Something that must come from all of you again, the younger generations than us. But coming back to it, we demonstrated an example of resources fresh, dedication to duty, clear vision, cooperative goals. Younger generation from the part of that. I think we should go back to those national items for the sovereignty, unity, and progress and stability of our country. That's first and in it. Say, two tribes and tongues are different. In brotherhood we stand. We are still same Nigeria. All my other five have different styles and methods of a responsible leadership and a true democracy. This is the time to believe in something more and this is the time to have faith in yourself and your fellow Nigerians. Let us believe that we can call forth a better destiny. A new day must stand and the bleak night of injustice must fade into the past. We continue to build our democratic edifice on a solid foundation of fairness, transparency, and merit. Therefore, we must find those who are responsible for the bloodshed, but who must apply justice. Those with human blood in their hands must be brought to justice. I already see it. If you have compassion for this nation that gave birth to you, members of the audience, you will surely see it too. Nigerians stand at a divided junction. Our challenges are manifold and profound. Nigerians stand at a divided but so are our collective abilities and talents. 
We produce 170 million of the most adaptive industrial economic unit on earth. What is that? I talk about our people. Our task is not to lament the great numbers that we are, but to reform the political economy in a manner that put them to productive use. We must begin and end our pursuit of economic balance with the precious things this nation produces. Not only must we use what we make and make what we use, we must make world the world values. You had a development that is comprehensive in education. You know, we have uh, an improvement in uh, public school attendance. You have an improvement in passing rate in Lagos. To become the great nation that we want to be, we must reform and retool the economy according to our definition. What is best for our own people, we cannot assign that duty to anyone else. World credit is available, that is anti-corruption. If our credits are open and people need a car, they don't have to pay four million cash at the same time. We don't have to pay for a house of 10 million, same day, same month with cash. Once you give us credit, tie it to mortgage, yes, and we can pay instrumentally. We have reduced the propensity for corruption. We have the land, we have the mind, we have the capacity, we have the intellect, we have the ability. We must industrialize and transform our economy so that it provides more employment and other great opportunities for our people. This structure needs to build to enhance the existing world. A coherently planned and integrated infrastructure, including the grid. The most single important sector for the government is infrastructure. But the most single important item of them is power. Power has been the greatest discovery of humanity in the last 1,000 years. You and I lost so many nights when we were working on independent power. What we can be proud of today is the fact we broke the monopoly of electricity generation in this country. I am proud that I brought independent power to the idea to this country and they still have 300 megawatts that is going to national energy. But still, we must move on to either coal or any source of energy that can enhance our industrialization. In a more effective system, the economy will be fashioned to serve the concrete needs and legitimate aspiration of the people. We must simply work for the people in a way that enable them to better work for themselves. No nation without its challenges. Even America is facing challenges. We didn't say we will not be challenged, but we have to report to millions of Nigerians voting for us. This is because we are a nation still in the process of defining itself politically and economically. We are any day by day. Democracy, liberty, justice, and peace. They move so slow that they are opposite. But when they gain momentum, nothing will stop them. When now we need momentum in Nigeria, we shall not be stopped. Our country youths are crying for attention. They don't want to be beggars, they want to be workers. They want to see development that accommodates them. It is our responsibility to pay attention to issues of uh, security. That is one. Without security, you cannot see development. Without peace, you cannot see harmony and development. So we must all come together as each other's neighbors and be our brother's keeper. And uh, we must not allow any crack in the world of our unity, no matter how. Please put your hands together for that amazing animation presentation. And now, may we invite Mr. Ade Ipaye.
the Deputy Chief of Staff to the President and one-time Special Advisor Legal to the celebrant Bola Tinubu when he was Governor of Lagos State to recite the citation of our celebrant. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Ade Epaye, the Deputy Chief of Staff to the President. Mr. Ade Epaye, sir. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my singular honor and privilege to introduce a visionary leader who has demonstrated rare courage and commitment to the ideals of national development, justice, peace, and progress. One who has made personal sacrifice to advance the common good and who remains unrelenting in the search for responsible and progressive governance in Nigeria. In 1979, the young Bola Ahmed Tinumbu graduated Sumner Cum Laude, which is a first class degree uh, in business administration uh, with specialization in accounting and management from the Chicago State University, Illinois, uh, United States of America. He was on the university's dean's list throughout his undergraduate days. He also won the Outstanding Students' Merit Award and a Certificate of Merit in Accounting and Finance. In his final year, Bola Tinumbu emerged as president of the Chicago State University Accounting Society, a precursor to his very many leadership roles to come. While still in the university, Tinumbu was headhunted by such big companies like Arthur Anderson, Deloitte, Heskins and Sells, which is now Deloitte and Tooch, and Mobile, which he eventually settled for. At Mobile Producing Nigeria, which is now Mobile Nigeria, Ashwadu held leadership positions like that of the senior auditor and company treasurer with distinction. He retired from the latter position uh, to join politics in 1989. And barely three years later, that is in 1992, he was elected senator on the platform of the old Social Democrat Democratic Party, SDP. Following the annulment of the June 12, 1993 presidential election, which the SDP candidate Basharun Mashud Kashima Wabiola won convincingly. Ashwaju Bola Ahmed Tinumbu and others floated the National Democratic Coalition, popularly known as NADECO, to demand the actualization of the June 12 mandate. In the line of the struggle, he was forced into exile from where he continued with even greater vigor an irrepressible fighter for democracy and protection of civil liberties, Bola Ahmed Tinumbu endured political persecution, including numerous arrests and detentions, harassment, constant threats to his life, and years in political exile. But despite the wrongs done to him, he never sought retribution. He has forgiven those who did the injustice to him, and instead he has chosen to focus on the future by helping to build a democratic and peaceful Nigeria. The virtues of courage, determination, commitment, vision, focus, and strong sense of purpose that have characterized Ashiwa Jubola Ahmed Tinumbu's politics drove his emergence as one of the country's most successful governors after Nigeria's return to democratic governance some 21 years ago. His stewardship of Lagos State for eight years remains a reference for good governance in Nigeria and across the region. A first-class financial strategist, Bola Ahmed Tinumbu overhauled and reformed governance and revenue collection in Lagos State, growing the purse from a yearly internally generated revenue of 14.6 billion in 1999 to over 60 billion in 2006. His innovations secured for Lagos the revenue needed to improve the state and modernize living conditions of all its inhabitants. 
Perhaps more than any person since the return to civilian rule in 1999, Ashiwaju's action in maintaining his political party as a loyal opposition helped salvage multi-party electoral democracy in Nigeria. With this contribution alone, he has helped his nation keep to the path of good governance, human rights, and prosperity for all. Ashiwaju Tinumbu, along with a few other progressives, cobbled together that coalition party, the All Progressive Confre uh, Congress, APC, which in 2015 unseated a sitting president at the center for the first time in Nigeria's political history. That ensuing government, led by President Muhammadu Buhari, was re-elected again in 2019 based on its solid record of performance. One of Nigeria's leading national newspapers in a published piece described Ashiwa Jutinumbu as Nigeria's political samurai. And I quote, by his focus and determination, Senator Bola Ahmed Tinumbu has over the years carved out a distinctive personage for himself in politics. With a towering political stature, former Lagos State Governor and one of the national leaders of the former Action Congress of Nigeria, now All Progressives Congress, Senator Bola Ahmed Tinumbu isn't just a household name, He's an authority in the archery of the nation's body politics. He may have attained his enviable status through consistent ideological standing. It is certainly a journey of many years of struggle and the grit for change. End of quote. Also leadership newspapers, one of Nigeria's national dailies, expatiated on this when it conferred on Ashiwaju the Person of the Year Award in the year 2011. And I quote now from the leadership newspapers. Out of the socioeconomic and political fog that 2010 represented, at least three great themes emerged. The struggle between the search for democratic legitimacy and subsisting electoral injustices the tenacious resolve of courageous characters who dared hypocritical authority to prove points of principle and a pervasive sense of self-doubt as the nation marked its 50th anniversary of independence. Within this context, the year spawned a welter of heroes and villains from various arenas of human endeavor. But while some forces remained apostles of social political stagnation and retrogression, others represented untiring catalysts for progressive change. It is from this puzzling canvas that we must make our choices as to which personality impacted Nigeria most for good or bad in recent times. As it were, justice still remains the country's most powerful idea, but the struggle is far from over. After almost 12 years of unbroken democracy, impunity at various levels of governance remains a defining feature of national life. The successful reversal of some of the subsisting injustices within the period of this assessment, though the, through the influence of some courageous individuals in the face of dangers to life and limb, sets Bola Ahmed Tinumbu apart as a leader of note. Through his tenacity and uncommon focus in guiding the reversal of electoral impunity across a wide swath of the nation's political landscape, he reaffirmed the enduring fact that indeed justice is the first condition of democracy. Today, Ashwa Jubola Ahmed Chinumbu remains the most vociferous voice in the call for Nigeria to return to the part of true federalism, and for him, the star price is the enthronement of fiscal federalism that will give governors and chairmen fully funded mandates and accelerate grassroots development. One of Nigeria's leading daily newspapers this day in 2013 selected Bola Chinumbu as his man of the year. The paper described him as the man who rebuilt Nigerian opposition. In the words of the newspaper, Chinumbu, I quote, from the scratch, he built the Action Congress of Nigeria to a formidable political party 
that within a short time became the major opposition party in Nigeria. He deployed his resources, energy, and political acumen to give the ruling party a fight in the political space. The altering of Nigeria's political landscape and balance of power that occurred in November 2013 had Tinumbu's imprimatur all over it. The political merger that produced the APC is Nigeria's first, and Tinumbu was its chief architect. Thanks to Bola Tinumbu's untiring political maneuvers and nationalistic approach to politics, Nigeria is now a two party state presenting Nigerians with clear choices, and the all-progressive Congress is still thriving on the political landscape as a governing party. In tandem with the tradition of selfless sacrifice, political foresight, and unequaled commitment to progressive and people-oriented politics, we can confidently conclude that Bola Tinumbu has served the cause of humanity and expanded the frontiers of freedom and democracy not just in Nigeria, but also across the African continent. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I give you the great Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, Ashwaju of Lagos and Jagaban of Bogu Kingdom. Thank you very much. Thank you, please. Have your seat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ooh. Your Excellency, Mr. President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Mama Dubuari. Your Excellency, President Yojue, President of Liberia. Unfortunately, we missed by Kuruma, former President of Sierra Leone. My compatriot and friend, brother, former Vice President of Nigeria, Yemi Oshibajo. The Senate President, Senator Ahmad Lawan. The Speaker House of Representatives, a fellow Lagosian, Gajabi Amela and equally ably represented by the house leader, who is a repeater station, never been defeated. Well, here, First, the Chairman Kateka Committee of APC and Governor of Yobe. <laughs> Governor Mebuni. Former chairman of our party, Chief Bisi Akande. Let me now salute those governors. My governor from Lagos, I know the effort made to be here in person by you, Governor of Ogun 
governor of Washington, governor of Kuala, uh, and many other more governors. My wife is dealing with the crowd uh, in Bordelon, and she's uh, probably not even watching the Uh, recite, but without that permission, I couldn't be here without that collaboration. I won't have peace and courage of standing here before you. Very gracious woman indeed. To really salute all the members of the House of uh, Rep here. Honorable Faleke, thank you very much. He's been here for three days. That's why the Bad weather, I didn't catch you and many others who are there being around with me. But to go back, why are we in Kano for this colloquium? Why? It's to demonstrate to Nigeria at this critical time. It's because there is a full animal, a harder man, hard, eh? Harder man. Who gave his daughter? to a farmer, Yoruba man. And that full of it, that Yoruba. And some people are agitating wrongly. I say, okay, if I'm, if the colleagues can encourage and support me to go and spend a couple of days with my brother and in-law in Kano and demonstrate that he has not quarreled with me, has not seceded from Nigeria. I didn't need a passport or a visa to get to Kano. So maybe others will have peace of conscience and live in peace, harmony, and be loving to one another. That is what Ganduji and I are representing to show to Nigerians. And that is the purpose of today's colloquium. End of story. And to the organizers, they did a wonderful job. Putting it together without even knowing the political sagacity behind it. We say, okay, Kano. They say, go ahead. They go ahead. And Ganduji has been up walking, sleepless. And he walked me to death. I almost regret coming. Project this, project that, project this, project this, you know, it's inspection. If you see me dosing the way there, 
It's because I, I, I slept for a.m. this morning. Taking me all over the underground, the hospital connect, the whole emergency, the skilled acquisition center, reconstruction of the hospital, reconstruction of uh, uh, roads, and the underground connection. Kano, you are lucky. So that is it. Then, Mother Nature. Today, part of what human being reviews to really understand, part of the reasons why husband are moving around. Extreme climate change. This is not amateur period, is it? In Nigeria. Then the plane cannot land in Kano this morning. Very unusual. And that is what climate change could do for you, Mother Nature. So we better spend our economic, make sure we tune our economic program. And I'm here, national, I'm glad National Assembly members and and the appropriation committee and others are here. And some of them were there in Kaduna with me at Arewa House lecture. When I re-emphasized the fact that this is the star, this is the time to put stimulus expenditure in place. This is no more time for austerity. I hope you listen carefully. This is not the time to constrain the economy. This is the time to create the opportunity. If you hear America spending 1.9 trillion and they're not looking back and they're still asking for three trillion for infrastructure and renewal and creating jobs. And your own unemployment rate is at 33%. And you ask us to keep on fasting. We're fasting no more. The one we are fasting spiritually is a voluntary. We have been fasting since many years. I hope the National Assembly, I hope the President himself will not pay attention to austerity. I spoke about it just this last Saturday. Inflation is a question of your inflation. It is only the state that must constrain itself and balance budget. It is only the local government that must restrict itself and balance budget. Sovereignty is that of Nigeria and is the only the federal government that has that, that sovereign power and must use it for the benefit and development and the health, quality of life of Nigerians. 
That's why they are sovereign. It is time. We are under police. And we are, comp we are competing with arm robbers and the bandits to recruit from the youths who are unemployed. That is 30% unemployed. Recruit 50 million youths into the army and the, uh, the take away from their recruitment source. What they we eat? Cassava, uh, Agbadu, uh, corn uh, in the morning, uh, yam in the afternoon. It's growing here. You create demand and consumption. For over five million uh, army of uh, boot camps, we create our food. I mean, that's money for the farmers. That's consumption for the soldiers and skill development. Don't call them by literature. Don't talk about illiteracy. Anybody. Who can own gun? Who can handle gun? Who can cook gun and clean the chamber and uh, cook and shoot? Is technically competent to repair a tractor in the farm. Not when you can create a, a log dream in a computer that you are technically competent. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those who are working on sugar cane farms and who can do so many other things and transfer key labels. Those who can do a cotton. Not when you bring fabric from China and other, you become a nationalist. No. I never, I never know what you call conflicts until I go to America. And it's from our corn. This alcohol that we were using for <laughs> coronavirus, what is it called? I never know it's from corn, the corn we grow here. And you can oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. how many of it can we produce? Uh, we can cover the entire West African sub-region. <laughs> Let's do it at home. Let's do a whole lot of things. Here. We, 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 we can create the jobs. We can create the jobs. You know, the jobs here. Surprisingly, when you see the social media these days, you find a very creative mind of Nigerians. I salute you. I salute our youths. They are angry. They are showing their anger. But we will appeal to them. We will listen to our sisters and brothers uh, teaching us how to get them engaged. Uh, maybe some of us are old versions but if we don't mix it too, uh, the agitation can be dangerous. We have to mix it so that Nigeria is handled carefully. We can promote unity 
and common destiny and common patrimony in a better, more creative way. Something we've done very well in Lagos State. Can he brought us to be a, in the entire country one of these days. Thank you very much for today. I'm very proud of what you have done for me. I'm greatly honored. Uh, once again, all of you here should thank Ganduje, Umar Ganduje, for what we have been able to show Nigeria together. That, uh, you know, Fulani, man, Yoruba man, can show the entire nation that in harmony we can show Nigeria that perseverance, great understanding, is a common blood that is flowing through our veins. You learn lessons from this, all day. And the most peaceful state is kind of. So, once you create peace, you create investment friendliness, an investment opportunity and destination. I want to say thank you very much to everybody here. I appreciate the celebration. I wish we can continue to tomorrow morning, but I know you, you have enough travel and some people walk till they break here. Thank you. God bless you. God bless Nigeria.
like to thank the Motion Symphony Orchestra. Thank you so much for that beautiful rendition. I would like to specially recognize the presence of Malam Nuhu Ribado. You're welcome, sir. I would also like to recognize the presence of Al Haji Kashim Imam. You are welcome, sir. And all the royal fathers here, you are welcome. Thank you so much for honoring this invitation. And happy birthday to Jagaban himself. I would like to invite the governor of Yobi State and also the acting chairman of the All Progressive Party to give a vote of thanks and also to call his... Uh, colleagues, other governors, to wish Ashwaju happy birthday through Zoom. To the Macababu Mutin, they are the Zayana came and Lamuni. As you are watching more Lamuni, please talk to me. Usubila is a mila limina shaitan or Jim Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Your Excellency, our leader and dear President, President Muhammad Buhari, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Your Excellency, the Vice President, President Yemi Osibajo, President of the Senate, the Speaker, House of Representatives, Senators who are here, and members of the House of Representatives, our host, Governor, his Excellency Dr. Abdullah Umaru Gonduje and other governors, the celebrant, His Excellency Aswaju Bola Ahmed Tunubu, our pioneer national chairman, Baba Kande, and other distinguished leaders here present. extremely distinguished ladies and gentlemen. My role is a very simple one, to say thank you to the organizers, the discussants, and the attendees. However, before I say thank you, I want to say with all sense of satisfaction that this colloquium is with a difference. It is different because it demonstrates the sense of unity in Nigeria. that we can celebrate one another outside our immediate environment gives our country and people a great hope and future. I'm also happy that today in Kano, we are celebrating a great leader, a nationalist, and a bridge builder. This, this is a testimony of building more bridges across the country. I sincerely thank their excellencies the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the President of the Republic of Liberia, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for finding time to be part of this great historic event. <clears throat> Our gratitude also goes to Dr. Enes Koroma, former President of the Republic of Salyon, members of the international community and, and the panelists. 
to the governor, government, and good people of Kano State, you have by this event demonstrated uncommon sense of unity at a time when our unity in diversity is being challenged in some states. We say thank you very much. <clears throat> to the organizers, you have done us proud by this well-organized occasion. It is an honor done to Aswaju and indeed to all Nigerians who share our common dream of a united and prosperous country. To all those who attended this occasion, physically or by virtual, we appreciate you all for identifying with this great event. I want to once again congratulate His Excellency Senator Bola Ahmed Tinubu, the great Aswaju, the Jagaba of Borgu, and now of Africa. I pray Almighty Allah grant you many more years in good health, increase wisdom and strength to continue serving humanity. I sincerely thank you all. And this now my singular honor to invite uh, the President of the Senate, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and my colleague governors to say happy birthday to a leader and a great Democrat, Senator Bola Ahmed Tenubu, virtually. Can, can, technical team, can you bring on the Zoom? Okay. The speaker, go ahead, sir. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, very distinguished uh, guests present today. Let me very quickly jump the protocol and go straight to the celebratory day because I, I believe to recognize everybody, every important person here today will be stealing the thunder from Ashiwaju. Today is Ashiwaju's day. It's about him and it's about Nigeria. And I make bold to say many of us, me inclusive, owe our political successes to God. But I know and we recognize that God did not come down. He uses Ashiwaju as a vessel uh, for us to get where we are today. Um, Ashiwaju, he's, he's known for his uncanny and unparalleled ability and capacity to identify, spotlight, and zero in on talent. He's done that with me. He's done that with so many of us. And that is what, that is the mark of leadership. There are so many things and so many superlative words that have been used to describe Ashiwaju today. So I'm not going to bore you and I'm not going to be repetitive. But I, however, I must say something to the hearing of everyone. I do not know of a man or woman, dead or alive, in Nigeria that eats, drinks, walks, sleeps, politics, 24-7, 365 days a year. I have seen it. I have witnessed it. This is a man who goes to bed at 4 a.m. on the day, and he wakes up at 11. Attending to people, all walks of life, north, east, west, south. For me, there's only one word to describe somebody with that kind of capacity. It's called gift. And it's the gift of God. And that is what God has given him. I don't know anyone else that can go through that 365 days a, day, a year, attending to people from 11 a.m. to 4 a.m. And he's still standing. Uh, I, I thank God for his capacity. It is divine. It is divine. And I wish him well. Today, we have listened to and been the richer. Uh, for what we have heard, heard, what we have learned, and what we have heard, uh, what we have um, heard today, uh, let's put those things. Let's practicalize those those things so that we can get to our El Dorado in Nigeria. Uh, for Ashwaju, you may not know this, but I'm here 
uh, via Zoom. I've read chats. I've read comments on Zoom. There's an outpouring of love from all over the world for you. I'm reading them. I'm seeing them. And it gratifies me. It makes me so happy that what you have done, the investments that you have put in, financial, energy, contacts, is appreciated by so many. I thank God for your life. Like I always say, happy birthday to you, Ashwaju. May the best days of your past be the worst days of the future. Happy birthday and God bless. The governor of Lagos State can go ahead. Thank you very much. <laughs> President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Mr. Vice President, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, oh, the Senate President and other members of the National Assembly, um, my colleagues, governors that are here and are in Abuja, in Kanu, and in other parts of the country, our leader, the Ashwaju himself, and all of our viewers worldwide, I want to say how truly delighted I'm here this afternoon with my brother governors. We would have all wished that we're in Kanu with you. But like you said during your speech, this is the reality of our time. This is what climate change is teaching and has taught each and every one of us. But indeed, we can still celebrate you. And we all can still come together, even in this large number. We have listened to all the great speakers today, but your comments still resonate, and I'm sure it will resonate with all of us for a very long time. Very classic, Ashwaju. And you have explained to us in three, five minutes what true federalism is. You've reiterated to us what it means with peaceful coexistence amongst ourselves. You've explained and you've shown us <clears throat> the importance of job creation for the youth and ability for us to care for our aged. These are what you stand for. This is classic Ashwaju in three, five minutes. We can't but continue to thank God for your life. We can't but continue to thank God for giving you to us at this point in time. My prayer and our prayer in Lagos is that God will continue to be with you, to give you good health, a sound mind, and continue to lead from the front. Your extreme. Technical team, can you go to another governor if it's possible? Okay, so uh, I think we're having some technical issue. Uh, please, can you take us to Lagos? We'd like to see our audience in Lagos. Is Yeye there? We'd like to see our audience in Lagos. Technical, please take us to Bodilon. Can you take us to, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, are you there? Vegas, we can't hear you. We want the energy. Maybe they can't hear us. Okay, can just wave your hands. Please, if you can hear us, wave your hands. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me? Okay, no, 
Can we go to Bojo? Okay, so please take this option. Okay. Okay, just wave your hands. Please, if you can hear us, wave your hands. With your okay, kind permission, can we hands. chant happy birthday as you are you? Maybe the network is the governor of Malta still with us? Technical team, any of the governors that are still online with us, can you link us with them? Okay, I think we're having technical issues. Okay, we're... Okay. No, no. The South South. Go ahead. He's open. Welcome, sir. Oh, my God. Can you hear me? Speak up. Can you hear me? Can you hear you? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Mr. President, of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the, the Senate President, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, my fellow governors are here with me seated and those are in Kano, all other members of the National and State Assemblies, distinguished and eminent guests that have come together on this day, 29th of March, to celebrate and indeed an icon and a titan of our time. Yeah, I assure you, we'd love to have been there with you in person, but we only made it as good as condition. Technology this time, is just an expression. So we are with you in spirit. Today, on the occasion of your 69th birthday, it provides us another opportunity to express gratitude. And congratulations of congratulations. It cannot be no. of leaders in a wide range of human endeavors remain reference points. We to go ahead because we can't hear him. We thank Tenure as a of, of, of uh, era. For the state. And all the governors that have joined us and wish Ashwaju happy birthday. Thank you very much. Lagos State News to put Nigeria on the global record. Testimonial to your enviable leadership. Okay, thank you so much. Now we are going to go into another form of celebration. Uh, please, I'd like to reiterate that we will be doing this in an orderly manner. The order of photograph, I will direct the order of photograph. So please maintain social distancing and please respect the protocol, I plead with you. Uh, I would like to invite on stage the celebrant, Jagaban. Please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the celebrant and the governor of Kano State.
Only the celebrant. Celebrant on stage. All the APC chieftains. Please, you can take the children away now. You can take them. All the APC chieftains. Please respect the protocol. <laughs> Okay, so please, uh, we'll like the second batch, please. Um. Please, those that have taken picture, can they come down the stage, please? Those. Please, when you when you have taken a picture, please go down. There are other people that want to take okay, a picture. Okay, please, please, if you have taken a photograph with the celebrant, please exit by the right. Please exit. Only the governor and the celebrant should remain on stage. Only the governors and the celebrant should remain on stage. If you have if you have taken a photograph, please exit by right. The, um, I would like to right, welcome, please. On the, you can please, move to the right. Those who have taken like the picture, they should move to the right. All the VIPs in the first and the second row. All the VIPs in the first and the second row. Please join the celebrant on stage. All the VIPs, the first and the second row. Please join the celebrant. <laughs> I saw some motion in Sawa, I saw some motion. Dagaban is a day. Oh, say, Tame, Tomato, man, and no one in all land in my food by the oro. Dagabano, Balaji, I made it to no boo. Oh, so I didn't come. I see what's on to a Dagaban. 
move to the right. Everybody that are taking a picture, move to the right. Please, picture. please exit the stage if you have. Please, please exit the stage picture, if you have please taken move a picture to the right. with the celebrant. The exit right, please. Please exit through please the right. Please exit right. Please exit right. Okay, did If you have taken a photograph please with exit the celebrant. Please exit to the right, please. Please, exit the place is crowded. Right. Please move. Um, please, I need help here. The, 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 the picture session has ended. Um, please, no more photographs until everybody leaves, until everybody leaves the stage. Until everybody no leaves the stage. No more photographs until everybody leaves the stage, please. Only the governors and the celebrants are required to stay on the stage. Hey, Please Please, please everybody stage. go down. Unless you want us to use security to move you. Please exit the stage. Exit the stage. Only the governors and the celebrants are Please required to, to be the right. on the stage. Kindly exit the stage. On our Please exit to the right. Please. Exit the stage, or we're going to call security to move you Please down. exit the stage. Please exit the, sta the stage. Please respect the celebrant and respect protocol. Please respect the stage. Please, please I can be on my there. Please, those that have taken a picture, if you have taken a picture, please go down the stage. Anybody that has taken a picture, please exit right. Exit right, please. We would like to recognize the presence of Imam Abubakar Abdullahi. Thank you so much. Please exit the seat. We would also like to recognize architect Kabir Ahmed. The program is over. The celebrants can go down. Your Excellency. Your Excellency, happy birthday. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, sir. Let me... Ladies let me and gentlemen, um... Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. You, you have been a fantastic crowd. God bless you. So we meet again. Good afternoon and farewell. I am Bafa Saleh Hadeja. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for coming to celebrate with Jagaban. My name is Stephanie Adams. Do have a great day. Thank you, Kano. Please. Only VIPs will go out of the door on the left. On the left, everybody else use the right. Please, only VIP.
bees will go out from the door on the left. Everybody else uses the door on the right and other exits. Technical, please give us some music. Thank you everybody for coming.